So welcome to our uh, new episode with this delightful new book uh, which is recording uh, spoken histories of entrepreneurs uh, the indian iconic entrepreneurs uh, sonu uh, it is a absolute delight to read this book uh, this is the second in the series i believe the first one was on gujar mal modi uh, men who made india and this aptly titled as a man who saw tomorrow uh, it's been a pleasure to read this book thank you so much nutan i mean it's really so heartwarming to hear this really thank you so tell me this idea of recording the lives the personal and professional lives and the journeys of entrepreneurs how did it start in your mind what was the journey like okay so if we are talking only about this series you know i'll just come to that in a bit but i do work in the area of family businesses and uh, the more that i spend time with businessmen industrialists entrepreneurs the more my respect for them goes up and uh, i do find that even though attitudes have changed among people vis-a-vis business people industrialists etc uh, there is still a little bit of kind of looking down upon uh, by other people who are professionals or others on businessmen and so we you know when we look around we see successes of sports people of politicians of film stars of you know other professionals but we are very wary and cherry of uh doing a rara and celebrating the success of businessmen so when i did the stories of these business people these industrialists these entrepreneurs to the wider set of people the wider set of readers because as ordinary people all we see are the the facade the trappings of people who are successful we read about them but we really don't know what has gone into the many 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 years of hard work and determination that have got them to the place where they are today so my sorry my earlier books were about people who are contemporary but then when i was talking about uh, uh, with my editor at harper collins we were you know like bouncing ideas off each other and he talked about the fact that uh, we it, there is really no stories about people who laid the foundation for india industry that it exists today uh, because a lot of people who worked then i mean a lot nay all of them are dead obviously but a lot of them their families haven't been able to stick together they haven't been able to be as successful so we people really don't uh, remember them so that's that's how the idea of this series which is titled entrepreneurs who built india came about to bring i the- is a very timely intervention considering that for both gujarmal modi and for lala shri ram their children are now uh, in 80 and even beyond so it's a very timely intervention for you to record these oral histories yeah tell me considering that as you yourself said for gujarmal modi with his 11 children and for shri ram ji whose children are much uh, older and families are also you know there are so many branches how difficult was it for you to collate data because i mean you were uh, this is literally the last window for us to have real history on private citizens who played a part in making india as we know it today yeah so research is into two parts uh, one is you know talking to people and the other is studying from archives which includes books or uh, material that the families have anything that's in the public domain a lot of stuff that is not in the public domain uh for contemporary people it's easier to speak to lots more people because you know because of the fact that 
the protagonists themselves are alive, you know, their families are alive and their friends and associates are alive. But for Gujar Mal Modi and for Lala Shri Ram, uh, I was fortunate that I was able to speak to uh, their children. And, you know, since we are talking about Lala Shri Ram in particular, I was able to speak to their, to his grandchildren and great grandchildren. I mean, his uh, uh, three sons are uh, died long ago. Um, and the family has some kind of archives. There's some kind of uh, material that they got put together for their own internal consumption. Uh, so I do have access to that, but it is it is uh, it is it is rather tedious work because you know the material that's there is very boring. <laughs> I mean, it's all about set up factory in that year. And this was the amount of money he spent in buying so much of land. These were the number of people he employed, etc. Now, I am a storyteller at heart. And I believe that the best way to get the message across to people is to tell a story. So then my job actually begins after collating all the data then I have to like create a story. And uh, uh, I mean, most of the people in the narrative are real people. Uh, there are some that then I imagine. Uh, most of the dialogue is imagined, even though the situations are real, but the dialogues are imagined. And then, you know, and I do get a sense of how the person, the protagonist used to talk, because when I talk to the family, I get an idea about, you know, the words that they use, the kind of language that they use. So I try and, you know, develop dialogues on my own. Talking about uh, how to make a book uh, alive with stories, with instances, uh, yeah. I will also focus not only on his entrepreneurship and his factories, but also on instances that you have uh, detailed, which are very interesting. For instance, the incredible picture of a lonely childhood that you drew at yeah. the Haveli, where yeah. a small child in the middle of four or five adults, a silent house with no other children, no other yeah. parents. Uh, would you say that, you know, uh, the entire contemporary focus that we have today of uh, protecting children, of filling their days with activities, is counterproductive to really raising uh, you know, uh, tiger entrepreneurs. Uh, it was true of Gujar Malji. It is equally true of Shri Ram. Yeah, uh, Ram was a was a was had a difficult child, and you recorded a beautiful atmosphere in that. Uh, yeah. What is your personal feeling? So you know, actually, Nutan, we all know that it is our childhood that shapes our entire life. And the lessons that we learn, the values that we imbibe actually stay with us through the year. Uh, in Lala Shri Ram's case, uh, I just found it very uh, poignant uh, and also a bit ironic that the man who was the toast of Indian society uh, would never eat a meal alone, would always have a meal with at least 20 people, 19 of whom he may not have not even know. Uh, his house was an open house, everybody vied to be his friend. Actually was, I think, filling in a need, deep need of his that he had right from childhood. I mean, he was a much loved child. It wasn't that he wasn't a loved child. I mean, being the only child among uh, five adults, uh, because one of his uncles was traveling uh, out on work very extensively. He was, you know, loved and pampered. But because of his delicate health, uh, he was not able to go and play with children. And plus, you know, he was a little dark, he was crony, and children can be very cruel. So children made fun of him, would not include him in his uh, in their games and he really really wanted to be part of his peer group uh, and but you know what that did according to me was that he just became a great observer of people 
and he he uh, he observed people he he heard what they said he picked up the nuances of interpersonal dealings uh, body language that he may not have otherwise if he was like a happy go lucky child playing with children who has the time to sit and you know observe other children or observe other adults so what he did not have on what he lacked on one hand actually gave him such a great competitive advantage as he grew up uh um uh, and he made the most of it i think i'm sure he did it unconsciously but uh, uh he uh, and when he did become successful uh i've heard tales from his family i've read about uh his house i mean it was an open house people came and stayed there for years there were rooms marked for guests and they could just come and stay there any time so there was a family that stayed there for years i think 18 years or 20 years and he was always surrounded by people why to why uh, uh, nana shri ram should be a textbook study for all business entrepreneurs as well as students of mba are <laughs> you said how he was a man who had to walk his way up from first doing his own business getting his own money getting his own job two failed businesses not an easy entry into his own uh, family's business starting from the factory floor where he spent time on the on the factory floor with workers where not a lot of people knew that he was related to the owners uh walking uh, back home from the factory every day for an hour going and coming and this is why you talked about one very interesting uh, time when he would spend time at the shops the fabric shops and he would ask them how is the fabric coming from dcm and then not knowing that he was the owners he was a member of the owners family and they would ask him that why do you ask about dcm and he said mai to ek So yeah. this happiness came from there, and this grit came from there. Uh, can you tell us why it's important, even for science of big families, to let their children experience this? Yeah. So I would actually expand that a bit. I I am going to say it's not only important for the science or the next gen of family business owners to let the younger generation go through that, but even in professional companies. you know new mba entrants who come out with such an attitude these days who want to go straight into making strategy it is so important to understand your customer it is so important to understand how the product or the service works on the ground and today uh, you just talked about you know as when he would go back he would spend time in chandni chowk old delhi cloth shops and check for quality etc today ceos and you know today is we call it market visit and the the only thing is that uh, shri ram used to go as almost incognito and therefore was able to get uh, a lot more honest feedback but you know when a sales head or a ceo of a company goes accompanied by his or her entourage i don't think he gets the real uh, feedback and even if the people on the ground want to give him the real feedback the entourage kind of shush them up you know because they don't want to appear bad in front of their bosses so this connect with uh with the end user with your customer with the trade is just so important and today we learn about it but i think the entrepreneurs of the old just had that innate sense in them and uh, they did it and today we just give fancy names to them so talking of uh, being a pioneer uh, one of the biggest uh, thing which runs a thread that runs through the book is how he had a deep deep connect with his workers he knew that yeah. without his workers love support in fact ownership he could never have been the industrialist the successful industrialist that he Yeah, he came not only from the time he had spent on the factory floor at the very inception, but also from the fact that he had uh, really spent time with all the workers at different, you know, ginning mill, uh, uh, others, 
And at a time when people saw labor simply as a nut and bolt in their ambitions to make money, we saw them as very important components. The first industrialist, perhaps, to put fans for his workers in yeah. a factory, you know, a fabric factory which has a lot of ambient air which is polluted. He put humidifiers. Yeah. And he put technology and spent from his pocket in those days of slim profits and the, uh, the struggle at the inception of the factory to yeah. invest in his workers yeah. and only then go and create a system where he would create housing for workers, dispensary, uh, and then even cultural activities and places for them to enjoy films. Yeah. Uh, absolutely something which was unheard of in India. And even Ashwiram had not been exposed because his first visit abroad was in 1929. So this is, we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, much more. Yeah. It came from his own mind. Yeah. Uh, And these are fascinating things that you've written. Yeah. No, so I I continue to be uh, fascinated and also, uh, you know, respect uh, all the work that the entrepreneurs of the your act did, and you know today we have we have you know mega factories that come up. We have uh, IT and ITES parks and townships that come up, but the people of today just focus on office building facilities within the building. That's it. Yeah, they may have employee welfare programs within those offices. But what I find when I read about people like Lala Shriram or even Gujarmal Modi and, you know, some of the others, that they looked at the business in somewhat holistic manner. Uh, Business was business, factories were factories, but the people who were working in the factories also needed to be provided for. So uh, Gujarmal Modi built a whole township. I mean, there were factories. Modi Nagar today uh, is named, I mean, it was named after him in the 40s. But along the time that he was building the factories, he was also building the workers' colonies. Similarly, Lala Shrira. Uh, actually, it was his uncle who built the first core DCM factory. And Shriram was still a child. And he saw how his uncle focused on ensuring that the worker colony was also built at the same time that the factory was being built. So he had, he also had that grounding in it. And uh, he, he was convinced that the workers are integral to the success of any business. And therefore he fought for them. Uh, Sometimes he had to fight with the board of directors. Sometimes he had to fight with the management, but he was clear that it is the workers who are the real assets of the business. And yes, I mean, they had uh, swimming pools in those days in the uh, Shriram, in the DCM colony. They had theater, they had dispensary. They even had a a khada where they could do kushti and all of that. So uh, very interesting. That is very interesting student of Sri Ram's entrepreneurship, I did not know. And that Mm -hmm. is the incident when his younger brother, in a fit of anger, slapped a Raj Mistri. And the Raj had all the workers surround him and, you know, be sympathetic to him. And this particular issue was placed in front of Lala Sri Ram and how he handled that. I want you to tell that story. (laughs) Yeah. What a great leader of human uh, emotion he was and how much was his emotional intelligence yeah I mean so yeah so I think it was a very very uh, uh, shrewd piece of uh, uh, thinking that he did I think there was a little bit of drama that was added in but the overall effect was good so yeah so like you said that his younger brother who was just being inducted into the business was walking as from one factory to the other and there was like construction work happening for a factory 
And he saw some people who were just standing, loitering around and, you know, like just shooting the breeze. So he hid behind a pillar and he kind of observed them. And he thought that they would just, you know, go away and start working, but they didn't. So he marched up to them and uh, I think spoke to them aggressively, uh, Sri Ram's brother. And I think the workers may have uh, answered back or tried to explain and you know how it is. And now that man just happened to be the head Raj Mistri. So the Raj Mistri is equivalent of a very, very skilled, specialized uh, professional who is looked upon uh, with respect by all the others. Now, uh, 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 I mean, nobody could do anything with Changarlal, but uh, they all, uh, but I mean, nobody liked it. So when Lala Sriram was walking in walks that he did, uh, the the Raj Mistri, you know, fell at his feet and started crying. And so Sriram was obviously, uh, uh, I mean, he didn't know. So he asked him what had happened, and he said that Lalaji slapped me. So uh, Sriram thought that you know he was talking of he himself, Lala Sriram. So he was puzzled. He said, Maine to aapko mara nahi. So he said, Nahi, Lala Ji, aap to kabhi mar hi nahi sakte ho. Wo chote Lala Ji ne mara hai. Now, there, I think there was a moment of uh, decision for uh, Lala Sriram because he knew what his brother had done was wrong. But he, I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, deride his own brother in front of the workers who had uh, you know, gathered there, but at the same time, he could not condone the behavior. So, guess what he did? I mean, you know. So he he said uh, he looked at all the people who had gathered. He said, "Now you decide what should be the punishment." Now, obviously, how can people decide what should be the punishment? So they kept quiet. So then Lala Shriram looked at everybody and said, "Okay, if you don't decide what is the punishment, I will decide." So everybody kind of breathe the sigh of relief ki chalo hamare se to nahi kuch mang rahe hain so he looked at he got the raj mistri he held him by the shoulder he said dekho mere bhai ne tumhe ek chaata mara hai to tum ab mujhe ek chaata maro now obviously nobody was going to hit him i mean the raj mistri again fell at his feet and started crying and all the others just melted away so he just accomplished so many things in that one little master stroke of human management. Master stroke. Total master stroke. He massaged that Raj Mistri. He diffused the anger amongst the labor. He reprimanded his younger brother. He would never, I think, dare to put uh, Tanashi yeah. Ram in position. So yeah. it was all boxes ticked. And I yeah. thought it was a master stroke and it revealed how you have to be uh, a person of high emotional intelligence if you have to be an industrialist because people management is so yeah. very yeah e eq is just so important understanding what makes other people tick uh and actually when you uh, de analyze that situation and i mean no action was taken against anyone i mean he had a private word with his brother but there was no apology made to the mystery. There was nothing that was given as any compensation. But his own stature among everybody just went up and up and up. So all on the feet. It wasn't pre-planned. It, was it wasn't pre-planned. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting incident of high emotional intelligence and management and courage. Yeah. And very interesting is when... Uh, even though this was during the British Raj, he had decided to give all support uh, to the Congress Party. He uh, would donate handsomely to them and support the Swadeshi movement, which could have got repercussions from the Raj bureaucracy, and yet he did it. Yeah. At the same time, when he called, he invited uh, Mahatma Gandhi to one of the uh, functions. Picky. At Fiki, yeah. He had the guts to also tell Mahatma Gandhi that the Congress has mixed and ambivalent feelings about entrepreneurships, about uh, uh, industrialism. And on stage, he pointed this out to Mahatma Gandhi that 
Congress is making uh, proposed laws for the future, of, uh, you know, the independent uh, India without consulting uh, industrialists, which yeah. is, I thought that was a, a, a act of uh, utter uh, boldness because to speak to Mahatma Gandhi and advise him that uh, uh, something needs to be, that they need to be consulted was something big. Yeah. So, yeah. Talk about this. Yeah. So, you know, actually, this is something that all of us uh, have seen in our lives. And people of my generation, uh, when I grew up pre-liberalized uh, economy days, eras, I do remember how businessmen were looked down upon. I mean, if you were a businessman, it was assumed that you were corrupt, you were debauched, you were making money on the side. Uh, every, every negative trait was attributed to it. But if you saw a doctor, you saw a lawyer, you saw anyone else you who also was making money, you kind of looked up to them. So, um, I mean, such was the case even uh, in uh, pre-independence because, and this is the point that uh, Lala Sriram made to Mahatma Gandhi in front of everyone, that when it comes to asking for money to support the cause, you guys don't hesitate. You ask us for money, we support you. But you will, you know, if if you will not uh, give us the same respect that you give to a professional lawyer, a professional educator, a professional doctor. Uh, so what are we doing wrong? I mean, we are helping India in her economic growth. So do not look down upon us. And if there are policies that you're making, at least consult with us. So it, I think it just came straight from his heart because he did feel very strongly about these issues. Again, he had grown up in a household where his uncle was a patriot. His uncle used to have uh, these thoughts about how, how India, how an independent India should be economically. So he had these thoughts and he did want to see India uh, do well econo economically and also uh, become independent. And he saw himself as an active member of a large set of people who would help India get there. And therefore, I think he just couldn't understand why the, polit the political parties were keeping out. It was very interesting that he was bold enough not only to stand up to the British, yeah, and support Swadeshi movement, but reverse boldness of telling Mahatma Gandhi that the Congress was not taking the right decisions. I think, yeah, yeah, if Mahatma Gandhi had the kind of uh, lofty uh, personality that he had for an industrialist to chide him in a public meeting requires a lot of guts and boldness. Yeah, it does all. I mean, he shot from his hip, it seems. Also. Yeah, it also requires a lot of self-confidence. And I think it's, it stemmed from that fact that he had that bit of confidence because he believed that what he was saying was right. Of all his various uh, businesses that he ran, from the textile to sugar to uh, chemicals, these are all straightforward industrialist uh, you know, expansions and diversions. The most interesting... Uh, is when he got he put his hand in the uh, J Engineering to create the much loved brand, the Usha Sewing Machine. Yeah. Now uh, Lala Shri Ram was already in the eve of his uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, he, in fact, he was very close to retiring from uh, DCM. Uh, he met a person who himself, the innovator himself, was also a retired government servant, someone who was dabbling in an idea which had no touch with reality. Uh, they felt they were all right because there were 600 sewing machines which were imported, so they felt that they had a very good data. But when they got into the nitty-gritty, they realized that they're talking about a machine which had 350 Parts. components. Yeah, yeah. How Lala Ram, even at that time of poor health, and uh, close to his own retirement, would regularly travel to Calcutta and hold this company, steer it through turbulent quarters. And, but eventually, he got a product which became iconic. 
uh, an Usha sewing machine became a part of uh, every girl's uh, you know, dowry. <laughs> <laughs> in those days, yeah, well, we uh, would see these advertisements of teaching their daughters sewing as a skill to learn. So uh, this is a very interesting story. Only a passionate entrepreneur would put his hands into um, yeah into a third party idea startup idea. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I will not go into the details of the story because I do want the readers to actually pick up the book and read. But a couple of things that stand out for me from this particular story of how he heard the story of uh, the person who had set up the business of Usha sewing machines. Uh, you know, in today's term, because you know, a lot of your viewers may be younger people. You know, when you have an idea, if somebody today has an idea and puts in his own capital or starts off with some small seed money, uh, there is a proof of concept. But there comes a time when you need more money. And if you don't have more money, the, the entire idea and the business is in danger of just, you know, shutting down. So Lala Sriram came in as a... Um, call it what you will, a private equity, a venture fund, uh, call it what you will. He took equity in that. He, he put in his money and he backed the promoter. He backed the person, which is what people, VCs today actually look at the management. They look at the promoters of any business before they decide to put their mega million dollars into it. So Lala Sriram, hundred years ago almost did the exact same thing he took a call on the person he said I like his passion I like the way that he thinks about the business he knows his business he needs money and he needs guidance on how to manage people because you know you can be a scientist but you may not be able to manage people so he not only put his own money uh, he got rest in the company and he then gave this story of yours has only one parallel which I can think of. It is yeah. when Jobs was pitched the idea of Pixar. He was not an animator. He was not a filmmaker. He loved the idea. He joined that group. He became the facilitator and an enabler. Somebody else had a dream. He actually yeah. had a dream. He made it his own. He found, yeah. he found the investors. He found, he helped them create a factory. He found the land and he streamlined it. And finally, when he realized that the innovator was not the right guy to do the business of creating a machine and a factory floor, he gave him a handsome, a golden handshake and told him that now you've done your job, you've created all the components, you've done the engineering and now yeah. the factory be run by somebody else. I think the yeah. this example comes to more than a hundred years ago, is what yeah. Steve Jobs did to fix up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I just keep getting amazed at things that people did hundred years ago with such ease and uh, seamlessly, which today we spend so much time thinking about, reading about it, learning about it. Uh, but that's that innate sense of business uh, that exists in a lot of people. And I think that is what needs to be celebrated. I think that is what needs to be tapped into to make more people like Gujar Mal Modi, like Lala Sriram, people who can run, set up, build, run large businesses and at the end benefit not only themselves and their families, but also the country at large. As we come to the end of the interview of this delightful book, I would uh, dangle a couple of carrots. <laughs> I would say that the story of how Lala Shrira walked into a group of agitating workers yeah. and uh, actually went in and talked to them. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's tough out of uh, a film called Namak Haram in Bollywood. <laughs> And it seems as if uh, somebody had researched. I don't know if reality is <laughs> taking, yeah, is taking the inspiration from yeah. the movie or the reverse. Yeah. 
so vignettes uh, like the love story of sumitra and dr charitra yeah i think that was just so cute <laughs> that was really so cute that story requires a separate book from you <laughs> yeah i i yeah maybe 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 not maybe just offline conversations <laughs> delightful story so yeah lucky vignettes and these stories and i would say uh, i'm eagerly looking forward to uh, you know these stories being read by more people and for you to discover the next person that you would record i'm looking forward to who you do next thank you thank you session and all the best for this book thank you nutan it was a pleasure and i do urge all the people who are watching this uh do read the book because it's i'm not saying it yeah okay well i'm saying it also because it's my book but i also want to tell you that the story of of lala shri ram is just so inspiring and you know those of you who've been to either srcc or lsr or the shri ram school please read about your founder absolutely thank you very much sonu and thank you thank you, thank you.